Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miriam Keher Zachary. I am the president of Rita Foundation. On behalf of my team, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. The event is going to start at 7 p.m. sharp. Uh, it's going to be about digestive health and colorectal cancer awareness. So we encourage you guys to keep sending your questions in the comment section. And uh, you can send your questions in English or in Arabic. Uh, Dr. Zachary speaks Arabic very well, so he can answer those questions in Arabic. The presentation is going to be in English, but the answers to your questions will vary depending on what language you use for the question. Um, tonight's event, we have Dr. Ahmed Zachary. He is a medical oncologist, subspecialized sub in uh, um, gastro-oncology. And we have Dr. John Monson, who is the chair uh, for uh, colorectal surgery at Advent Health. Uh, they're both ready uh, to share with you valuable information and to answer your questions. Now, if you are interested to know more about previous events, we encourage you to check our pre previous posts on Facebook page. The good news is that now we also have a YouTube channel. We posted the last events uh, on our YouTube. Um, the last one we have done was with, uh, was with Dr. Uh, Monsef Slawi and Dr. Diaz answering questions about, about uh, the vaccine. So, um, feel free to go and check those videos. Uh, again, uh, I am encouraging you to, send, to keep sending your questions. Uh, we have collected a lot of questions so far, uh, but uh, we are open to gather more questions. Um, just going to move on to say something quick in, in uh, Arabic. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Today's event will be on the health of the health الزوج ديال الدكاترة دكتور أحمد زكري اللي هو مختص في أورام من الدم أو أورام الجهاز الهضمي ومعنا دكتور جون مونسون اللي هو مدير تنفيذي ديال جراحة الأمعاء ممكن يكون صفتوا لنا الأسئلة بالعربية ولا أون فرونسي وحتى بالإنجليزية البريزونتاسيون غادي تكون بال بالانجلي ولكن دكتور أحمد زكريا متمكن باللغة العربية والفرنسية ومستعد أنه يجاوب ب يجاوب ما صادقوا على على كيفاش تحكي السؤال غادي نبداو مع السبعة إن شاء الله Euh, oui, là, pour que tu te refoques à la, la fondation ou pour que tu te refoques à les événements qui ont été faits, tu as le Facebook page qui est là pour que tu te refoques. Et aussi, le dernier événement qui est là avec Dr. Monsef Slaoui et Dr. Diaz, il y a eu des questions sur le lycée. Tu as vu la vidéo sur YouTube. يلا بدينا يوتيوب دابا هادي فيو ويكس هادي واحد الربعة ديال الأسابيع دونك ممكن لكم تلقاو لي فيديو تما باقي لنا خمسة دقايق ونبداو دونك نشوفوكم من هنا واحد الخمسة دقايق إن شاء الله We'll see you at seven. Thank you. 
It's seven o'clock. John, it's uh, always a pleasure to have you, my friend, uh, giving great talks. So uh, the floor is yours. You can go ahead and start and share your presentation. And uh, we're going to gather some information and uh, some questions. Uh, after your presentation, I'm just going to have a little bit you know, to moderate and uh, uh, to make it kind of a bit uh, very simple and easy for the audience uh, who actually really are curious to know uh, what, how to deal with uh, colon cancer, uh, the screening and all of that with colon cancer. Thank you, Zach, and uh, thank you for the uh, uh, honor and privilege of uh, speaking to you tonight in uh, March, which is Colorectal Cancer Awareness um, Month. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking through some aspects of colorectal cancer and um, some reasons why we should be interested in this. It's important. Uh, uh, topic because it's a common condition, 160,000 new cases per annum in the United States. It's the second leading cause of cancer death with some 50,000 deaths annually, but it is preventable. This is a really important um, piece of information um, because not all cancers are preventable. Breast cancer, for example, is not truly preventable, but colorectal cancer is. And you might ask, why is it preventable? Well, um, there's a couple of reasons. Most colon cancers start from a benign polyp, and you'll see some pictures of that in a, in a minute. And that polyp doesn't go from scratch the very beginning to um, being a cancer um, overnight. It takes um, several months and years before it develops into a cancer. And Colon cancers do not spread quickly. So there's a big window in there for a screening to occur, an opportunity to prevent the cancer. We know that there are some risk factors associated with colon cancer. Um, and we know the genetics of the disease. So we can intervene um, with altering um, uh, risk factors or perhaps even taking some medications to uh, reduce the risk. And we'll talk about some of these aspects in due course. So here's what I was talking about a minute ago um, about the polyp cancer sequence. Um, over on the left, you can see a normal colonoscopy picture. This is what a normal colon looks like at colonoscopy. And then um, the next one along, you can see a little button, um, which moving along gets bigger. And then finally, 
turns into on the far right um, the biggest um, uh, uh, problem, which is the cancer. Well, the two in the middle can easily be dealt with um, by removing polyps and stopping it prevent, uh, uh, progressing to a cancer. And if we do that, it's been known for decades, almost 30 years now, that if you remove the polyps, you reduce the incidence of cancer. And this is really important. We also know a lot about the natural history of colorectal cancer. What happens if you just leave it alone and don't treat it? And we know that it grows bigger and bigger in the same spot and then can spread. Um, and it spreads through lymphatic vessels, you know, like the lymph nodes in your neck or um, under your arm. Um, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of lymph glands and channels around the body. And, and then it can spread through the blood and through the lymph glands and or the lymph channels and the blood, it can spread to distant organs, the commonest of which would be liver um, and then lung. A really important take home message is that the earlier the cancer is diagnosed, colon cancer is diagnosed, the greater the chance of cure. So if it's the earliest stage, 95% of patients will be cured of their cancer with treatment. And even uh, the commonest two groups, stage one and two, um, over 85% of patients are cured of their cancer. Um, stage four, of course, is, is the most advanced stage. Right. And although the long-term cure for these patients is, is, um, is low, it's getting better all the time. And in fact, 5%, um, is probably wrong. It's probably 15% now, even in the later stage with modern drugs and chemotherapy, um, uh, which is, of course, um, uh, Zach's uh, side of things as well. The spread, this is data from 20 years ago in, uh, um, uh, in uh, St. Louis and one of the big centers, roughly 450 cases. And you can see um, that 20 years ago, um, this, the uh, stage spread was roughly equal between um, the four stages, one, two, three, and four. This has shifted now with screening, whereby the vast majority are now in stages one and two, um, and only about 15% are stage four. So it's really important not to ignore any symptoms if you have symptoms um, and go and get screened. So what causes colon cancer? Um, almost every patient I see who has colon cancer asks me that question. What did I do? What causes colon cancer? And there's no, the answer is there's no single cause. It's, it's a common disease and it's, a, it's a, a result of multiple factors combining. On the one hand, environmental factors. Um, and we'll say a word or two about that. On the other hand, some patients have a genetic makeup that makes them susceptible to cancer. And then just as you get older, um, it, is a, it is a disease of the second half of life um, uh, from the 40s onwards, um, although it is getting younger. Um, and one of the uh, reasons it's getting younger is some of the environmental factors. It differs, this is not a very nice slide, but you can see it differs the frequency um, changes depending on what country you're in. And one of the environmental factors that we know relates to uh, the development of colon cancer is uh, meat consumption, um, particularly red meat consumption. And as you can see on the far right in the highest part, Canada, the United States and New Zealand, uh, these are countries that are notoriously associated with high quantities of red meat. They have a higher incidence of colon cancer. So your favorite uh, burger is not really uh, a good thing in terms of preventing uh, colon cancer. Um, you know, most people will recommend um, red meat only once a week. Um, and if it's red meat you're taking, then um, actually don't burn it. Um, um, slightly undercooked medium rare is the way to eat your meat. Um, because there are these Chemicals or carcinogens, they're called in the food and in the environment, and they damage cells in the body. We also know that fiber in your diet 
um, whether it's just natural dietary fiber or dietary supplements like metamucil, something like that makes a difference in preventing colon cancer. Um, the type, the amount of fat in the diet also increases thing, uh, the, the uh, risk of cancer. But a really important point here is that one of the reasons that um, colon cancer is becoming a disease of younger and younger people is because in the West, the incidence of obesity is rising. Obesity on its own is one of the most powerful causes of cancer in the body. It is not just that the person is overweight and may eat the wrong foods. The actual obesity in the body, the fat cells in the body um, contribute to causing, um, to causing cancer, not just colon cancer. So what about genes? I mentioned genetic susceptibility. Well, some genes um, are actually protective. Um, they protect the cells and they stop them growing out of control and becoming cancer. And some of these genes can become um, deleted or altered or damaged, and they can then free some cells in the body, which can then grow out of control and turn into a, a, into a cancer. So who is particularly at risk of getting uh, colon cancer? Um, well, um, as I said, uh, in latter years, so over 40 years, um, but that number changes when the patient uh, may have a family history of cancer. Um, so family or personal history of polyps or cancer is a very high risk factor. And then there are some well-known syndromes, familial polyposis is, or FAP, and that's what that picture is there, where the colon will have hundreds and hundreds of polyps. It's a disease of young people um, because it's inherited and um, the usual diagnosis age is around 18. And if left alone and untreated, 100% of those people will get colon cancer, not for another decade or so, but they will get colon cancer. Luckily, it's a, it's a rare disease. Commoner is um, diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, if a patient has extensive colitis, for more than a decade, then it increases the risk of colon cancer. So who gets bowel cancer? You might say, well, um, it's uh, not me. Um, I, I don't know people that get bowel cancer. Um, I used to work on the other side of the Atlantic and live in England and Ireland for many years. So these are some people you may or may not know. Um, this uh, is uh, Bobby Moore who captained the England soccer team to the World Cup victory in uh, 1966, he died of cancer. It's Harold Wilson, who was a prime minister of England. Um, that is on the right, as you probably recognize, is Prince Charles. The lady on the left is a lady called Lynn Foles Wood, who set up a large colon cancer charity when she was diagnosed um, with colon cancer when she was only 35. For those people who like cricket, um, this is a very famous uh, West Indian cricket player, Malcolm Marshall, very famous fast bowler who died uh, of colon cancer. And most recently, we lost Terry Jones from uh, uh, Monty Python fame, um, who didn't die of colon cancer, uh, but he had colon cancer some 25 years ago um, and was cured of it. Closer to the United States, Audrey Hepburn, of course, died of colon cancer. Um, Sharon Osbourne um, had colon cancer and is doing very well. Walter Matthau, famous actor. Um, Charles Schultz, uh, who uh, wrote uh, Peanuts, the uh, cartoon. Ronald Reagan, Vince Lombardi, the Queen Mother, and uh, Robin Gibbs. So everyone can get colon cancer, no one uh, it is not a. Uh, it is not selective. What symptoms would indicate um, patients might have a problem such as this? Well, blood in the stool, um, and we're not talking the occasional spot, but uh, blood that persists um, and does not go away for three to six weeks. Dark blood, particularly, 
a change in bowel habit that is different and persists. These are things that persist. We're not talking about somebody who has some diarrhea next Tuesday and that's it. We're talking about an increase in frequency that persists over weeks and weeks. Obviously, um, it's possible to get a sudden blockage of the bowel. Unexplained weight loss. Losing weight over a period of weeks and months without cutting down on food needs investigation. And any strange and bizarre lumps that the patient can feel in the abdomen that should not be there. But remember that many patients have no symptoms what, uh, uh, whatsoever. So there are many reasons why people and countries around the world have commenced screening programs. Um, and the reasons, of course, are because it allows us to find cancers earlier. You saw earlier that the earlier the stage, the higher the cure rate. It reduces deaths from cancer. We know that. The more you do this, the fewer people die of colon cancer. The recommendation now is to start at age 45. And there's more than one way of doing it, uh, of doing screening. Um, the, the worst way is not to do it. You choose which you and your doctor decide to do. The oldest and simplest way was um, stool testing, fecal occult blood it was called. What this does is very simple. A little sample of stool is taken and tested for blood. And if there's blood in it, then you have a colonoscopy. So it's a way of determining who should have colonoscopy. The colonoscopy is, of course, the gold standard. The big advantage of a stool test is that it's easy, it's cheap, but people don't like doing it, and you have to do it every year. The trials, however, that have been done on this show that it works. So if that's what you want to do, it's perfectly acceptable, and then respond if it's positive. The problem is it only detects about half of the cancers. Not every cancer produces blood, and it is even lower in terms of those polyps those little polyps that we want to find early and remove. And the opposite is true, even when it's positive, when there's a positive test, the majority of those patients don't have cancer. So it tends to freak people out at times and they get very anxious about it when they have a positive test. So it's very good for large populations of millions of people, but it's not necessarily the best way. But if that's what you wanna do, it does reduce cancer deaths. What about a flexible sigmoidoscopy? And you can see here the picture. The flexible sigmoidoscopy is a bit like a colonoscopy, except it only goes halfway around. That's great because it's easier to do. It's cheaper to do. It doesn't require sedation. Um, and it picks up most of the cancers. But it doesn't examine the entire colon. And a significant number of cancers are beyond the reach of that telescope. Having said that, it reduces cancer deaths by twice that of the blood test, uh, the stool test, 60%. So it's pretty good. Colonoscopy, we all know in, in the United States in particular, is the gold standard. It goes all the way around. It sees the whole colon. And really importantly, when it sees these polyps, it is able to identify them and remove them. So it's not only diagnostic, but it's potentially therapeutic. So this is why it remains the gold standard. The problem is it's invasive, it's expensive, it requires a very unpleasant bowel prep, um, but you only have to do it once every 10 years or five years. It's really good at what it does. Almost 97% of cancers will be picked up. And as I say, you can do it you can use it to remove the polyps. And if the test is normal, you don't need one for 10 years as long as you don't have any new symptoms. There are some alternatives in recent years, a virtual colonoscopy. A virtual colonoscopy does not involve the actual instrument. It involves a sophisticated CT scan that is able to see almost everything a colonoscopy can do. But it isn't able to remove a polyp. And if it does see something, then you have to go and have a colonoscopy anyway. So it's used selectively. What we know 
now on the TV is Cologuard. You, you hear this, on, you see these TV ads every day. Cologuard is another stool test. It detects DNA, in other words, genetic material that might have been shed by the tumor. And it's very good. It picks up um, cancers, but it doesn't pick up all of them, as you can see, um, uh, just less than 100%. But you have to have a colonoscopy. So if your cologuard is positive, you have to have a colonoscopy. And remember that if you have a polyp, um, uh, a large or indeed a small polyp, it's not nearly as good as a colonoscopy, as you can see in the bars at the bottom, Cologuard will only detect less than half of polyps, whereas the colonoscopy is able to uh, detect them nearly all. So the current screening recommendations for the average risk person with no high risk factors such as family history of other diseases is to begin at age 45. You can do the blood test, the stool test, and a flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years. But in the United States, most people recommend a colonoscopy every 10 years. The sad truth, however, is that most Americans are not screened. Um, some 30 years ago, of those over 50, only 17% had a stool test and only 9% had a sigmoidoscopy in the prior three years. These figures have changed dramatically, but they are still less than 50% in both groups. So there's a huge drive with initiatives such as Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month to um, increase these figures, which are truly life-saving events. So you take it into your hands, remind your own primary care physician when it's time for your first screening exam. So if you're 45, ask your primary care doc um, or your GI doc, shouldn't I be having a colonoscopy? Other things you can do, understand your risk factors. Don't live on hamburgers all day and every day and every day of the week. It's okay to eat meat, but maybe red meat once a week. So modify your risk factors, lose weight, um, you know, everyone, uh, uh, what, uh, struggles to lose weight, but here's another reason why it would be a good thing to do that. And take preventative steps. Um, one of these is calcium, is um, aspirin, um, and other nutritional supplements, calcium and folate. There is some good reason to think that taken in low doses, these may also help prevent colon cancers. Um, so the take home messages. Uh, for you tonight um, is to identify your risk factors, get screened, take a high fiber, low fat diet, and focus on your healthy lifestyle, and uh, get uh, um, go and see your primary care doctor if you notice any symptoms that persist over a sustained period of time. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll uh, Finish by pointing out that um, in Advent Health, um, there are many options for colorectal cancer screening um, delivered by gastroenterologists, by colorectal surgeons, um, and within a program that also has access for access to genetic screening um, and genetic counseling. So uh, thank you again for the uh, honor and privilege of inviting me along tonight. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, you're in the very good hands of uh, Dr. Zachary, um, who certainly speaks many more languages than I do. So I'm going to uh, hand back to uh, Zach at this point um, uh, for uh, the chat part of the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, John, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, some people from the audience, they have some of the questions. One of them actually is very interesting, which is pertinent to uh, the rise in colon cancer millennials. And her question is, uh, uh, what is the impact of the intestinal flora, which is the microbiome, in uh, dealing with colon cancer? Yeah, it's a, it's a good and very topical question. Um, it, it is less understood than the, than the impact of obesity. 
Uh, as you know, um, the rise of obesity in the Western world and in the United States in particular has been um, dramatic over the last two to three decades. And that is said to be um, the dominant factor um, in the um, uh, drive towards younger age um, in colorectal cancer, certainly in the United States. There is an increasing understanding of the um, intestinal flora, the microbiome. Um, there is some soft evidence that um, uh, daily use of, um, of probiotics um, is uh, protective in this area, as indeed it would appear to be protective in multiple health areas. The important thing to understand about a probiotic is that you do not have to go to um, uh, a dedicated health food shop and, and buy a very expensive one. Um, the simple ones available in Publix or wherever, um, such as Actimel or things like that, are absolutely as effective as the more, um, the more sophisticated and expensive ones. Uh, some other question, which is that's really in the field of your interest, John. Uh, by the way, for the audience, uh, John Munson, he is one of the world pioneers in colorectal cancer. Uh, he has brought uh, uh, tremendous expertise and uh, very much ex you know, respected expertise in colon cancer. John, one of the questions, one of the ladies has asked, what are my chances uh, to have colon cancer if I, was, if I got struck with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis? Kamaria. Uh, uh, it's a, a good question um, it, uh, uh, with a, a simple question, but not a simple answer. Um, the, the knowledge is mostly around um, ulcerative colitis, and it largely depends on how extensive the disease is. Uh, as, as you may know, um, people with ulcerative colitis can have their entire colon affected. Um, uh, by the colitis or just a little segment. Um, it's based on the extent and the duration. So the sense is that if you have your entire colon affected um, uh, and you have it for more than 10 years, it probably produces a threefold increase in, uh, in colon cancer. But remember that the risk, the baseline risk is not enormously high. So three, um, um, uh, a threefold increase does not mean um, uh, that you're going to get colon cancer. In fact, your risk is still low. And the, one of the good things about patients with um, colitis um, and Crohn's disease is that they do tend to be um, in the care of uh, medical gastroenterologists. Um, on a long-term basis and are very likely, therefore, to be undergoing um, endoscopy on a regular basis. So luckily, we tend to pick these things up a little earlier. Uh, actually, the next question actually is very interesting, which is you already alluded to. Uh, usually when you have, at what stage you will anticipate colon cancer presenting as symptoms? And this is already alluded to, but I think the audience probably would like to have another just understanding uh, is there a particular stage when you already start presenting symptoms? Uh, it can be, obviously. So uh, some symptoms such as weight loss and uh, more constitutional symptoms are associated with more advanced stage, but it's mostly related to where the cancer might be. So if the cancer is in the rectum, for example, um, near the anus, in other words, the outside world, then those um, patients often notice some bleeding because it's very... Uh, close by, whereas if it's all the way around on the other side of the colon, um, those patients will tend not to notice bleeding and they may not have symptoms. Um, what we do know is that if the cancer is identified on a routine screening, it is nearly always stage one or stage two. Um, and that's a, a huge um, improvement on waiting for symptoms. Screen detected cancers are earlier and more easily cured than patients who have symptoms. Uh, another question that's actually, uh, it's maybe probably a bit much, much more broad. Does it matter really kind of where the body arises, either in the colon, other parts of the, uh, of the body in terms of risk of 
cancer formation and oncogenesis. Where the polyp arises? Yes. Yeah. Within um, the colon and outside the colon. Well, the short answer is within the colon, it doesn't really matter whether it's on the right side or the left side or anywhere. It's all about how big the polyp is. Um, if the longer you leave a polyp, it will just steadily, slowly, but steadily get bigger and bigger. And once they get beyond about an inch in size, um, there's often a, a tiny focus of cancer in it. And the bigger you let it go, the more likely it is to have cancer, but it's not really influenced by where. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions is more kind of a little bit clinical question that the patient, the person had done some stool test sample, I think at home, it turned out to be, he has blood in the, uh, uh, in the stool. Uh, his next question, should I, uh, should the next thing to be colonoscopy and when can I do colonoscopy? Where can I do it? Um, simple answer. Um, if the, uh, if the stool test is positive for blood, uh, almost certainly, yes, you need a colonoscopy. Um, you can organize it through your primary care doctor. If you do not have a primary care doctor, um, you can um, contact Advent Health through the gastro. There is a, an online um, uh, um, a contact uh, phone number, which I'm sure um, Dr. Zachary will be able to send to the group afterwards um, in the um, colorectal cancer awareness month. Um, there's an online system to click on the link and, and give them your details and they will reach out to you and help you organize your colonoscopy. Uh, I, I, this question actually, I, I can I run to it almost you know, quite often in the, in, the, in the clinic. I'm sure you do, uh, John, is uh, a lot of people are going through uh, colon cleansing and they think that by doing so, probably they are reducing the risk of having uh, colon cancer. Uh, Kind of a bit. Is this something healthy? Is this something that's going to help them in terms of reduce the risk of colon cancer? Yeah, it's been around for years. There is really no evidence that it makes any difference to cancer um, uh, risk at all. Um, people may find it um, uh, beneficial from other health aspects or general feeling of well-being, but it is not uh, recognized to make any um, uh, to make any difference or reduce the risk of colon cancer. I would say that if you're having a colon cleansing, you might avail of it to have a colonoscopy at the same time because it's the, it's the same type of cleansing. Yeah, well, one of the questions that's come is a little bit, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, very kind of a bit broad as well. Uh, how can a patient decide between chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation? Um, it's a, again, a simple question um, with a complicated answer. For almost all colon cancers, and that's not the rectum, which is the last um, nine inches, um, but for the rest of the colon, we tend almost never to use radiation. And the primary treatment is surgery. And based on the stage told to us by the pathologist, about 50% of patients will then get a three-month course of very easily tolerated chemotherapy. Rectal cancer, which is that last nine inches, um, about 50% of our patients will get radiation therapy before um, surgery. Um, but an increasing number of patients will get chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and no surgery um, because the treatment has been so effective, it's simply gone away. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of audience had some of the questions that's kind of a bit, you were very kind kind of bit to answer all of them. Uh, the way how I thought about this, uh, John, is kind of you give talk and we I create debates that's also help the audience. Uh, since the topic was, you know, colon cancer in the era of, you know, COVID-19, I know you've been very, very involved last year with, with the highest leadership when the decision close, open, open, close, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, outpatient uh, centers for uh, uh, either colonoscopy or other procedures. Do you think, first of all, how did kind of a bit came by to, how did we survive that during that last year? The second thing, are you anticipating, John, any change in the incidence of colon cancer based on that gap of the whole year that we went with, you know, 
uh, afraid of opening, opening and doing colonoscopies? So uh, taking it backwards first, uh, so even when we were shut down to the most extreme extent, we did not shut down for treating cancer patients. We continued to operate on patients who had cancer. Uh, and so that issue was fine. But you're right, um, right across the country and indeed across the world, diagnostic services were to a greater or lesser extent shut down or reduced. Um, patients, however, with symptoms um, were not prevented um, from having colonoscopy, and we continued to do that because they were considered to be high risk. Um, there was a slowdown in patients having screening, in other words, totally asymptomatic patients, um, but uh, the, our, all of our endoscopy groups have been working full blast um, uh, for quite a long time now and um, have caught up, have more than caught up at this stage. And remember the second surge of COVID, we did not close the endoscopy, we just closed the inpatient. So the outpatient areas and colonoscopies, they continued unchanged. So, uh, you know, some of the audience we have most likely kind of they're from Morocco and other places in the world. And we're going to take this on uh, YouTube where there, is a, there are a lot of people from home and Europe that will be listening to this. So uh, the discussion we always get into, uh, John, is the cost of the, what we do as physicians, the impacts of what we do as physicians in the healthcare, the economy of the healthcare globally. Uh, in terms of colon cancer screening, uh, you know, if someone coming from the the uh, the third world or developing country is listening to us, and you kind of will be talking about screening, uh, what would what kind of advice would you give them in terms of you know where there are not that many kind of centers equipped with colonoscopies and the cost of it? Uh, what kind of what what would you suggest? So there is actually very good literature and evidence on that very specific question. In terms of cost effectiveness, screening for colon cancer is 10 times more effective and less expensive than breast screening. Um, it is literally an order of magnitude more effective and less expensive. It's extremely good value if you are a government minister or in charge of healthcare resources. If I was in a developing country that had limited access to endoscopy facilities, then I would definitely screen using, uh, screening the population. I would screen using uh, stool tests because what that would do is select the patients who definitely need the colonoscopy. Um, if you have limited access to colonoscopy, you can't colonoscope everyone, but I would colonoscope those patients who had a positive test and that would be a rational use of uh, the facilities. And that's what's happened in, in many other countries. Um, the, the first of which, of course, was the United Kingdom, which has a national stool testing program um, that's proven very effective. Uh, some of the kind of, it's most of the audience that locally here are in central Florida. And most likely they are kind of a little bit, when it comes to colon cancer, they are naive in terms of the steps to take once they, they get that colonoscopy or that initial diagnosis, you may have colon cancer. So uh, uh, in kind of briefly, I know that's kind of a little bit, this is very kind of basic question. Briefly in few uh, steps, uh, John, if someone gets positive tests either uh, Colorado or uh, so he had colonoscopy and probably he think he has cancer. What's the next step? I think the next step, um, if you, if you've just uh, had a diagnosis of colon cancer, um, I think you should make sure that you are referred to a center that has a team multidisciplinary approach to your care. In other words, um, a team of people that can deal with whatever is needed for you and who specialize. Centers of excellence have, more, have much better outcomes um, than um, centers that have just general practitioners. So um, you need to go to a colorectal surgeon and a, colorectal, a specialist colorectal surgeon who works on a daily and weekly basis with a specialist medical oncologist and a specialist radiation oncologist, not because you're going to need all of those treatments, but because your case is different to everyone else's 
and you need a team-based approach to give you the very best personalized approach to your care. There's no question that you would, if you flew from a, a transatlantic in, a, in a, a jet, you would want the pilot to be a specialist in that jet. You would not want the pilot to be a general pilot flying helicopters. You do that in every other aspect of your life. Why would you not do that for your colon cancer? Go to a center of excellence that can provide you with the best care. Great. That's actually one of the critical kind of thing that we hear is uh, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, what are the basic steps to get there? Uh, I think this is one of the physician in training with us in, uh, in the institution. His question is, thanks for the great discussion. I have a question. What are your thoughts on prescribing aspirin for colon cancer prevention? Which is you alluded to that uh, initially. Uh, so what's, what's the thoughts in terms of, you know, aspirin in colon cancer prevention? I think uh, increasingly the evidence would seem to suggest it has a better effect on colon cancer prevention than it does on heart disease. Um, but I think there's um, pretty good evidence for both at this stage um, for the so-called baby aspirin. And I, I think it's a, a good thing. Uh, John, I know kind of it has been a long day for kind of a bit for uh, both of us and kind of trying to kind of. Can you hear me, John? Yeah. Uh, we can see. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I know it has been a long day for both of us and you've been in the OR early morning and so forth. We try kind of a bit to summarize and minimize this kind of question to for the audience kind of a bit to see uh, what the, to get maximum information to help them to increase their awareness about colon cancer screening and what to do in this time of the COVID thing. And uh, uh, what do you think of there is another, another question? What do you think of Gerson therapy for cancer patients to rebuild new, to rebuild new cells. Uh, I'm sorry, say it again. Gerson, I never heard of it. Gerson, G-E-R-S-O-N. I'm not sure where this person kind of get the, the, the name. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know. But it I sounds know. like Irish. It sounds like Irish word, uh, John. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Um, it's, uh, we better find out about it, Zach. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, the person who kind of a little bit, you know, uh, 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 sent a question about the person, if you can be very specific, we don't, uh, personally, I don't know, and Dr. Manson does not know what Gerson therapy either. Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms of surgery, uh, uh, John is, you know, oftentimes people are concerned what type of surgery and so forth. Uh, you know, a patient who comes to you, what kind of a bit, uh, what will distinguish someone like yourself with the, uh, you know, uh, high experience and expertise in colon cancer and someone else in terms of surgery, in terms of outcome, timing in hospital and the nature and the type of surgery you would, you would recommend to perform? I mean, I think the biggest differences in people who have their surgery in a center of excellence with true specialists is um, probably in two areas. Um, uh, if not three. So the first area is that the vast majority of patients will have their operation done using a, a minimally invasive approach, uh, either laparoscopically or robotically. Um, and what that means is that if, uh, barring any unforeseen um, problems, they should go home from hospital within two to three days. That's number one. Number two, I think the uh, we know that the chance of a patient in a specialist unit having a, a colostomy or a bag um, is dramatically less in a specialist unit. In our patients, um, our, stone, our, our risk of a patient having a bag um, overall is considerably less than 10%, and nationally, it's 50%. Um, and so that's a big difference. Um, and then the third thing is, in terms of the ability to do a complex cancer operation, the specialists uh, are going to do a better job and therefore the long-term cancer outcome, which is after all the most important piece, is better. The chance of being cured of the disease is definitely better with specialists um, than with general surgeons. Great. Uh, 
it's it has been kind of a bit very uh, interesting kind of a bit uh, topic in in uh, in the evolution of colon cancer, not only in terms of uh, uh, the generation that we have been seeing more millennials, more youth. And I know for a fact, Johnny have a patient, she's 22, 23, that has seen in hospital, which is very kind of a little bit, you know, uh, it, there are a lot of questions that come to mind and, and uh, you know, why the youth is more kind of a little bit diagnosed with colon cancer, we, we see them, it's more aggressive. The question that's kind of a little bit goes along and I think you answered that a little bit indirectly. Uh, uh, what do you, how do you feel about millennials and colon cancer, number one? Number two is, uh, the, the recent loss of uh, some of the uh, stars, including the young uh, uh, star and the young artist the, who played the uh, Black Panther with colon cancer at early age, it creates another kind of liberty, you know, thinking about the genetics amongst African-American and amongst minority. How do you feel about that, John? Well, I, I, you know, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty well-studied entity. So the first thing to say is yes, indeed, and very tragically, we do see people in their twenties um, uh, with colon uh, cancer. So um, if you are in your twenties and you have those same symptoms that we discussed earlier on, don't assume just because you're in twenties you can ignore it. That's a bad idea. Um, Chadron Bozeman, uh, I think, uh, was a little older. He was in his forties, um, and he was unfortunate because he had stage four uh, disease, um, and which is unusual in that age group. Um, I think he um, uh, is an example of the fact that the outcomes are indeed worse in the African-American population. Their incidence is higher. It's possibly environmental and dietary related. Their access to healthcare is poorer. And so they tend to present with more advanced disease. Um, and the same is true of other ethnic groups who struggle with access to healthcare facilities, such as some Hispanic groups as well. Um, so it, it's, a, it's an access to healthcare issue as well as environmental and dietary issues. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's always kind of a bit, you know, uh, I'll tell you, John, it has been always uh, very intriguing. And in one of the slides you alluded to is uh, the risk or the incidence of colon cancer worldwide. And in the slide, you have Nigeria. You had like, you know, the Nigeria, it's low in the bottom. And you, then the slide, you were alluding to the consumption, the red meat consumption. Interestingly enough is, you know, there is always debate in terms of uh, what is the difference between uh, uh, an African a patient with diagnosed with colon cancer and African-American diagnosed with colon cancer. Knowing that ethnically and genetically, probably the genetic makeup is the same, that goes along is, as you alluded to, is the environment part of it, or just the evolution of the genetic, you know, uh, uh, alteration that we see also all time. Yeah, I think that's right. And we know from all sorts of population studies that if you transplant uh, a group from one country to another, they take on the risk factors of their new country. This is one of the physicians, I think, what is the latest developments of personalized medicine and this screening and treatments for colon cancer? Well, I think personalized medicine is the future of medicine. Um, it, it, it's personalized from the stance that not every operation is the same. It's not a one size fits all operation, number one. Um, number two, it recognizes that patients are different, not only in their well-being and general fitness, but what they want, um, what they, uh, they need to take part in the discussion. Um, and number three, in uh, areas such as chemotherapy, um, the personalized genetic profiling approach has really become the standard norm approach, and as it should be. Um, it's not just one drug for everyone. Obviously, some drugs are used more widely than others, but increasingly, it's going to be um, uh, a bespoke approach for every individual. Great. Uh, we kind of live, it's kind of, it's almost near to the end of the discussion. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, I think the audience had uh, most of her que the question answered. Uh, and the presentation was excellent, John, as usual. 
uh, your expertise in terms of how to explain not only the disease by itself is the impacts on the uh, global uh, approach, how to uh, deal with cancer overall has been always impressive. Uh, thank you so much, John. And uh, you're very welcome. It was always a great chat with you. And I'm sure kind of a little bit we're going to chat on Tuesday morning again. <laughs> exactly. Thank Take you care. so much. And thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, your questions. Uh, we hope that we were able to answer all of them. I'm pretty sure that we did. Uh, we have a great team here, and everyone was on the top of it. Um, uh, please feel free to share this uh, video on uh, Facebook. We will also post it on YouTube, but for right now, you can share on Facebook. I'm sure there are a lot of people who can benefit from it. As you know, it's already late in Morocco. So hopefully by tomorrow, some people will have access to it and get some of their questions answered. Um, I could not have done it without these people behind me. We're missing one more person, Hafid. Uh, but uh, team, you did a great job. And is there anything you want to add? Yep. All right, thank you. Thank and you. thank you, Dr. Monson, if you're still watching us. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.